once around the Hyades star cluster. The Hyades is the nearest open cluster to the solar system, and as such, you can see it over quite a wide area of the sky. To find it, you take the three stars of Orion's belt as pointers and go up and right from them, and you will get to the bright star Aldebaran, which has a characteristic orangey-red colour, and that seems to be at the corner of a V-shape, which marks the face of Taurus the bull. Um, the rest of the members of the Hyades make up the rest of that V and are much further away than Aldebaran. Aldebaran is really quite near to us um, at about 65 light years, which is uh, two and a half times closer than the main cluster itself. So it's just a line of sight thing. So the Hyades themselves are sufficiently spread out that there was no danger of them being confused with a comet. And so Charles Messier didn't put them in his catalogue, but they turn up in three others. They're marked as Coldwell 41, that's Sir Patrick Moore's catalogue, Colander 50 or Melot 25. And we've got a lovely picture and a little uh, inverted star map showing the layout of the face of Taurus the Bull, the Hyades cluster. Now, together with a sister cluster, the Pleiades, that are both in the constellation of Taurus, these are supposed to mark a feature called the Golden Gate of the Ecliptic. And that's because all the planets on their journey around the sky pass between these two clusters, as does the sun. And in fact, in antiquity, the sun would have been placed in the sky just between these two at the equinox. Um, and so it marked the beginning of the year. So this was seen as a very important uh, passage for the stars and planets or the sun and planets to go through between these two star clusters and begin their journey around the sky. Some of the statistics about the Hyades, well, just 150 light years away, I think the most modern number is 153. And the core of the cluster containing 500 stars is concentrated over a region of about 10 light years in diameter. And those 500 stars add up to about 400 solar masses. The majority of these stars are fairly modest, um, and we'll see why. The full extent, though, is about three times that size, 33 light years. And there's perhaps another 500 stars to be found in and around the uh, outer reaches of the cluster. It's about 625 million years old, and that's old for a star cluster. Um, it's getting on for the maximum limit. We'll come to that as we go through the presentation. And because it's only been in existence 625 million years, not the 4.6 billion that the sun has been around, the composition of the stars has formed from a cloud of rather more enriched uh, material. So the universe gradually gets dirtier as time goes on. Hydrogen and converted to helium, so the proportion of helium goes up as stars do that. And they also, for giant stars, make the other heavier elements. And these are present in somewhat larger numbers in the material of these stars than the sun because they were formed much more recently. Now, the Hyades is probably related to the Beehive Cluster, about which I have another talk, the Beehive Cluster, also known as Prasipi. These have the same age, the same enhanced metallicity, the same composition, and the same proper motion across the sky and the same trajectory around the galaxy. So it seems that they may have both been part of uh, a common origin somewhere along the line. It's very hard to be certain about these things. Trying to trace the orbits backwards runs into the difficulties with mathematical chaos. We also see that the Hyades cluster might be associated with a whole lot of extra stars that seem to also be moving through space together. And this was uh, first noted back in 1869 by Richard Proctor. He spotted that the proper motions of these stars was all very similar. And uh, 
the idea was that maybe there had been a Hyade super cluster at some point that broke up somehow, and perhaps that's where the beehive and the Hyade separated. But only about 15% of the these wandering stars that are moving around the galaxy on this similar trajectory are chemically similar. The other 85% don't seem to fit. So there's some doubt over exactly what's going on here. And it's possible that the cluster and all of the other objects that are moving in this way are being influenced by the rotation of the outer edge of the bar across the middle of the Milky Way. So we have a barred spiral shown here. That's not the Milky Way. We can't take a photo like that because we're stuck inside it. So this is another galaxy that we think is roughly the same shape as the Milky Way galaxy with this extended bar feature. And it may be the tidal effect of that bar that is causing these guys to move in this similar manner. I've got this map here, which shows the sun in the center and goes out to 100 parsecs, so 325 and a bit light years. And we've got the Hyades star cluster up off to the left there. And so other groupings in particular, there's the Ursa Major co-moving group. Uh, those are also a group of uh, stars, about 50 of them, that all seem to be traveling in uh, the same direction, not related to the Hyades. Um, but this particular smaller cluster, the Ursa Major co-moving group, is definitely seeming to be breaking up and dispersing. So that shows you how wide an area the Hyades really occupies there quite an extended structure. And when we look at the masses of the stars and the distribution of masses in the Hyades cluster, something str strange is going on at first sight. Clusters form out of the collapse of clouds of gas and dust um, in a pulse of star formation over a very short period. And that should create a full range of solar masses from the very largest hot stars, you only get a few of those because nature finds it difficult to make the really big ones. So uh, the, the distribution is shown here. We expect 0.36% of the stars to be super giants, 0.8 to be giants. Then there are two to four solar mass ones, around 3%. Ones like the sun, maybe uh, in, in larger numbers. And then the orange and red dwarfs dominate. And of course, you should also get a whole lot of failed stars, brown dwarf stars, which didn't achieve the necessary minimum mass to kick off nuclear fusion. Those should be formed in even larger numbers, along with a whole lot of gas giant planets not attached to stars, free floating. But it seems that the Hyades cluster is deficient at both ends of the scale. It doesn't have the large stars, neither does it seem to have very many of the small ones. But there is an explanation for this, and it comes in two parts, really. The first part relates to the life cycle of stars, something I've talked about many times in these lectures. And that is that the big stars live fast and die young. So actually, any stars that were in the giant range, the hot blue stars, and even the hottest of the white stars have gone through their life cycles in 10, 100 million years, maybe a couple of hundred million years, and died um, as supernova explosions. Only the smaller stars have the life expectancy to still be around 625 million years on. And the Hyades now only has stars in the main sequence, ordinary stars, of 2.3 times the mass of the sun or less. So definitely the, these uh, four bottom rungs of our stellar mass ladder. And you can see that if you plot the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for star clusters, you can see that uh, as a star cluster gets older, the turnoff point where the stars are beginning to cease to operate on the main sequence, beginning to consume uh, the uh, hydrogen in their cores and evolve into red giants, 
is this turnoff point, and uh, they cease to be on that diagonal line and go over to the red giant side of the diagram. And uh, that sort of burns down like a fuse burning down. The older the cluster gets, the uh, more of the stars have managed to achieve that, um, and only the smaller stars are left. So what we've got left in the Hyades, well, we've got four former A-class stars at around two and a half solar masses that are now swollen up to red giants. And those are some of the ones that you see as the bright members of the V-shape. Um, they uh, get very bright because they're large. They have a large surface area. So even though they have cooled, the total amount of light coming from that much larger radiating area is uh, way more than it would be for a similar star that was uh, similar temperature, but smaller. So we also have eight white dwarfs that have been located. And these are probably the result of slightly bigger stars around the three solar mass range that uh, have gone past the red giant phase, puffed off their outer layers as planetary nebulae and uh, collapsed down to a white dwarf core. So this is the end stage of the evolution for them. They will no longer carry out nuclear fusion. They'll just sit there cooling slowly through eternity. So this explains why there are none of the very large stars in the Hyades. And the reason that there are no small stars relates to a phenomenon called mass segregation. Close encounters, due to the chaotic orbits of these stars all whirling around their common centre of mass, results in the massive stars sinking into the centre of the cluster and the smaller ones being scattered to the outside. It's all down to the fact that uh, gradually the energy ends up equally split between all the components. The equipartition law of energy says that energy will flatten out and so the energy of the large stars and the energy of the small stars has to be the same. But energy, kinetic energy of motion is a half mv squared. So with more mass, you need less velocity to have the same energy. And so large stars end up with lower velocity and small orbits and small stars end up kicked into high velocity, long orbits. And the smallest ones may end up being kicked out of the cluster entirely in a process called evaporation. So most small star clusters disappear after perhaps only 50 million years. And we've got an array of different star clusters here. And you can see that some of them have these uh, concentrated centers and less powerful stars towards the outside. Some are more broken up than others. And so you can sort of go through and try and rank these into their degree of evolution of the uh, mass segregation and the evaporation. But larger star clusters can hang around for longer and a big star cluster like the Hyades with as, as many stars as it had is uh, certainly managing to hang on, getting on for this sort of upper limit of around a billion years where we seem to think that uh, there aren't really very many clusters older than that. This is because the stars gradually get kicked out and the future for the Hyades is that it will continue to lose stars. They will be shed out into the galaxy uh, following near misses and gravitational slingshots hurling them out of the galaxy. And as that happens, the mass of the cluster is slightly reduced each time. And of course, that means that the grip on the remaining stars is less. And so gradually the uh, thing will be easier to escape from and you end up with just uh, the tiny little central few stars tightly bound together um, evolving on their merry way but most of the cluster will have disappeared. Certainly we think that the lack of brown dwarfs in these clusters is because they get ejected very early on along with any free-floating planets so we should find a lot of these ejected, free-floating, rogue, brown dwarf and uh, giant planets wandering around. It's just that they're extremely hard to find. Now, in terms of planets, Epsilon Tauri, Ain, the bull's eye, has a gas giant exoplanet. Um, that's the other one at the other side of the V from Aldebaran. 
And this was the first planet to be located in any open cluster, so a bit of a record holder. And since we found that one, several more have been located, and there's a full range of hot Jupiters down through uh, Jupiter-sized planets and even down to mini Neptunes that have been detected, including some multiple planet systems. So it seems that uh, as the techniques are improving, we're finding more and more of these solar system-like arrangements wherever we look. And so finally, just to wrap up with the Hyades, uh, I, I mentioned the golden gate of the ecliptic. We've got the Hyades, the V shape on the left with Aldebaran at the top left of the V. And we've got the Pleiades cluster down to the bottom right there. And that's the planet Mars in the center moving through the golden gate. Fascinating to see that. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed that. And we'll be back with another astronomical object in another talk.